Okay, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you. Um, Leslie Straffy, uh, Chair of the uh, Chief Executive of uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and Lee Hi. Lewis, um, Permanent Secretary at DWP. For those of you who have been sort of watching us huddle together here um, over the previous uh, few minutes, you'll have got this sort of vague idea that we've not exactly spent sort of days and days uh, rehearsing uh, exactly this presentation and how we're going to do it together. So if you get a sense that you're at the first rehearsal, the dress rehearsal, the first night and the last night at one and the same time, you're dead right about all of that. Um, uh, what are we, though, going to talk about? We're going to talk about a program of joint working which started in 2006. Our two departments, uh, HMRC and DWP, had always worked together um, a great deal and over many years. But it had always been rather sort of ad hoc on specific issues as they came up uh, in a rather sort of bitty and uncoordinated way. And all too often, I think, we thought that um, the results could have been far better than they were. So um, a few of us at the time, uh, Paul Gray, who was then leading HMRC, uh, and I, and uh, Leslie, who at that time, interestingly, was in DWP as the Job Centre Plus Chief Executive, and other colleagues, uh, Bernadette Kenny in the Revenue, thought that we could do better than this. So we came up with the idea, why don't we have a structured programme of joint working? And that's really what we want to tell you something about this afternoon and we'll be uh, very keen to hear your thoughts on that and take your questions uh, at the end of that. This was all part of the wider government transformation uh, programme and agenda. David Varney's uh, uh, report was pivotal and key to all of that. And the aim, actually, was a pretty simple one, and it's there as the, the third bullet point on that slide. Uh, could we do two things at one and the same time? Could we deliver better customer service and better value for money for the taxpayer. And why we thought, actually, that we could do both was that many of the customers we serve in our two organizations are the same customers. And at the moment, uh, and certainly in the past, they dealt with us separately, and often it must have seen to them, and sometimes it still seems to them today, that we're pretty uncoordinated in the way we work together and the service we offer them. And that's not just bad service for them, it's also costly for us and for the taxpayer. So that was, in a sense, the driving force. Could we actually, at one and the same time, deliver better service and have better value for money for the taxpayer? So we looked at where we might uh, concentrate some areas of joint working. And this has been a very variable uh, feast over the years. It's moved, it hasn't stayed the same at any one point. But we looked and thought there were some obvious areas where we ought to concentrate. Uh, the obvious one, claiming benefits. People need to claim benefits, um, often mostly from the DWP, from our agencies, but the revenue and the whole area of tax credits, which comes under the revenues area of responsibility, mean, and I'm going to talk about one such example in a moment, mean that many people have to deal with both of our departments, if not other organizations as well. Could we make that simpler? Could we make that easier? Could we make it a better experience for the customer? Could we make it better value for money for the taxpayer? Then we both run very large fraud operations, because surprise, surprise, there are people out there who want to defraud the revenue, and there are people out there who want to defraud the benefit system. And surprise, surprise, some of those people are the same people seeking to defraud us both. But too often in the past, we'd operated entirely independently, sometimes not even knowing that the same people were being investigated by both organizations. And then and then and then, they say, um, which certainly wasn't a feature back in 2006, but is most certainly a feature now, uh, then has arrived the recession with real impacts on both of our departments. So we've looked very much at how we can extend our joint working into that and into a range of other joint initiatives as well. So that's the background. And I'm going to talk now about one of the first key areas uh, where we've been working together. That's the area of claiming benefits. 
And then I'm going to hand over uh, seamlessly um, to Leslie, who's going to talk about uh, another. And then between the two of us, uh, with some apparent appearance of coordination, we're going to uh, come through the range of that. So claiming benefits. Every year, as it says on that slide, around 3 million people, that's quite a lot of people when you stop to think about it, about 3 million people lose their jobs and claim benefit. Now, almost uh, without exception, they will claim the main benefit that my department, Job Centre Plus, administers, which is Job Seekers Allowance. But in very many cases also, in very many cases also, they have to sort out their tax credit position, which has changed after they've lost their job. And in very many cases also, uh, not in every case, they also go on to claim housing benefit, which just to add sort of spice and complexity to our system is administered by a third set of organizations altogether, namely local authorities. What was the truth about our uh, systems before we um, subjected them to the uh, joint working and looked at how we could do better? They were extremely complicated, is the first thing. People had to work through the systems, the complexities, and the bureaucracies of three separate organizations, DWP, Stroke Job Centre Plus, Revenue and Customs, and local authorities. It took a long time. It took a long time to sort that out. On average, for somebody losing their job, it took 26 working days, not calendar days, 26 working days from the point where they made the first phone call and said, I've lost my job, what do I do? To the point where the system had sorted them out. And imagine that if that's an average, it concealed lots of cases where it went on for much longer than that. And 26 working days is more than a month. The systems were highly repetitive. Um, people were asked routinely and regularly for exactly the same information. Um, and there was a paradox in that in particular because uh, some of the information that each of the organizations collected was actually passed between the different organizations where serially it was discarded and not accepted because it hadn't been asked for by the organization in question. And I remember going to one of our contact centers in DWP early on in this process, and uh, a member of staff said to me, Lee, we operate um, the ABC principle here. And I said, that sounds really interesting. Uh, what's the ABC principle? And uh, she said to me, accept nothing, believe no one, check everything. And that was the uh, counter, that was the sort of um, absolute heartland principle. So customers were getting asked again and again, and still are in some cases, as you'll see, for the same information. And that wasn't just a real pain, but actually an awful lot of evidence that it put people off claiming, uh, not just claiming benefit, but going back to work. Most of us in this room have the good fortune that we're in reasonably stable and continuing employment. Many of our fellow citizens aren't in that position at all. They cycle through periods of short-term employment, unemployment, and so on. If you are unemployed and you have been through the most enormous hassle to get yourself established on the benefit system, and then a Job Centre Plus advisor says, would you like to uh, take this job? <coughs> uh, it may, of course, uh, not last forever, but hey, it's a good idea. Uh, you may think, uh, well, you may think it's a good idea, but I know if I leave this benefit system and then the job doesn't work out, I have to go through all of this complexity yet again. And we know from a lot of research we've undertaken that that's a huge deterrent. Okay, so what did we do? We, first of all, established, next slide, a joint program. Uh, involving not just, actually, in this case, our two departments, HMRC and DWP, but also, because they were critically part of the issue and the solution, local authorities. And the aim, the aim, was to provide a single front end, uh, could we do that, via Job Centre Plus for those losing their jobs, so that only one organisation became the interface with the customer. Could we gather the evidence and the information we needed once only rather than many times? Could we speed up the whole process and could we reduce overpayments? And actually, could we emphasize the importance of work by bringing forward in that process the point at which the individual sits down with a member of staff, an advisor in a Job Centre Plus office and seeks work? 
Um, and before we uh, move to uh, telling you the outcome, uh, why don't you hear something about the outcome from people who've been involved in the programme? So if we could have our first film clip, this is a moment of great trepidation, please. The problems before the in and out of work pilot for our customers uh, were that they would have to provide the same information repeatedly to different departments. They saw this process as, as a barrier, so they may want to, instead of thinking of taking up work, they would contemplate the idea of rejecting it because of the lengthy process of having their benefits sorted out. It was a big decision going back to work, uh, and I was very concerned about my benefits, how, you know, if I would lose out. Um, I was worried that I was going to have to wait weeks. Um, yeah, I was scared. I was a single mum. I really wanted to get back to work, um, so I went to the job centre and saw Frankie, who, was my, who became my lone parent advisor. Hi, Caroline, you're right. What Job Centre Plus does is the inf we're the information gathering centre for all the other partners that need information from the customer, so we gather all that information at the front end for everyone. Before the pilot, um, we would relied on the customer telling us about any changes in their circumstances. But now um, that change comes direct to us through the Job Centre, so we're getting to know about it more quickly. They've helped me fill out all my forms to do with um, starting work, filling out my housing benefit forms and my working tax credit forms and my child tax credit forms. And she checks them all over and makes sure that I've done them correctly. I just go to the one building. I have Sahida to help me out. She fast tracks a lot of things, which is on the computer. It's all done really, really quickly. We've had tax credit payments go out in a few hours. You know, before that would have taken a long time, that would have taken weeks, possibly. The big difference to my life being in a job now is uh, my confidence has come back. Um, I got a little bit of extra money to treat myself and treat my kids. If it wasn't for Frankie, I wouldn't be doing the job because she was just so much help for me. She's the best. <laughs> We're all trying to get the same result at the end of the day and we're all working towards the same things. And I just don't know why we didn't do this years ago. So there we are, those are some of the uh, real people who've been um, involved. So what is the process now in, in very simplistic terms? Um, uh, someone makes contact with Job Centre Plus who take all the information needed, not just for Job Centre Plus and the Job Seekers Allowance claim, but for HMRC, so the tax credit office can regularise the tax credit position uh, in whichever direction is necessary, but also for the local authority. And critically, um, all the um, uh, bodies have worked together to uh, satisfy themselves that the information taken once is verifiable and is accurate, and everybody then accepts it. There's no huge amounts of rechecking and so on and so forth. Uh, all of that sounds, uh, you know, simple. That sounds one of those kind of, well, just why haven't we always done it like that? Or, you know, why did it, um, uh, you know, kind of take so long for that penny to drop? But actually, when you start working through a process like that, which is why we piloted it, you come across every issue under the sun uh, in terms of how difficult it is to do. And one of the lessons I think that Leslie and I will talk to you about is if you're going to be involved in a programme like this, you have to be relentless, actually, in saying, well, that's really interesting that there are 83 difficulties, but now would you like to bring us the 83 solutions? But what are the results um, so far? Uh, first of all, uh, ministers have agreed in all our departments and the leaders of the local government association, and uh, it was an absolutely uh, key moment when they did, that this process is going to be rolled out nationwide and it's gone past being a pilot. This is now on its way to national implementation. Um, out of 400 local authorities, it's now live and operating in 122, and the remaining almost 300 are due to roll out by early next year. 
it's up to 15% faster. I think, actually, that is an underestimate, because what's happened along the way is some of the early learning, we decided not <coughs> to wait. There were some things that were so obvious that we've put them in as we've gone. So actually, it was much more dramatic in the early pilots. Uh, the later pilots are already uh, operating or starting from an improved process. 74% of customers um, find the new process easy to understand. Only 25% do not. 25% is still an indictment of the system, uh, just to be clear, because that's a quarter of your customers who still uh, don't find it easy to understand. But at the beginning, uh, it would have been at least uh, the inverse of that. Uh, heaven knows about the 1% who have no opinion. 48% uh, of customers who claimed previously think the process has improved. Only 15% think it's got worse. 77% now rate the way the two departments are working together as good, and only 15% rate it as poor, and that would have been almost diametrically the opposite before this process. So I think a really good example of what can be done, but what took enormous effort on the part of the project team, and which took an enormous effort to drive that through, and I personally believe without the leadership of the uh, joint steering group and this joint program would not have happened. And at this point, um, uh, by absolute agreement between us, I turn over to my co-presenter, Leslie, to talk about benefit fraud. Thank you, Lee, um, and good afternoon. Nice to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience. Um, we saw some great examples of customer service there um, in, in the joined up service that has been spawned from in and out of work. Um, but in, in every uh, part of society and in every area of government policy delivery where we are trying to deliver something good for many, many uh, people, millions of customers, there are inevitably those who take advantage um, of the system. And the area of fraud was something that frustrated me greatly uh, from the very early days of DWP being formed. Um, in the end of 2001, the new department was created, uh, and in 2002, we launched Job Center Plus. My job at that point was um, the field director for operations for London. And we, we inherited a lot of joint machinery between the old benefits agency and DSS um, and local authorities and a different set of machinery from the employment service. And at the end of the day, all of my experience of people who bend and break rules, who steal from the system, um, has generally taught me that bad people don't confine themselves to the walls and the silos that we put ourselves into um, in Whitehall. Uh, and both from dealing with internal fraud um, in, in, in my career and benefits fraud, we generally find that people are defrauding um, various parts uh, of government. So uh, as we progressed the joint working, we were very clear that there were lots of areas that we could do better. And taken into this conversation, my experience of joined up government, which right from 97, from the first Blair government um, came to power, everybody started talking about joined up government. Well, my experience that far was the only place it had ever been joined up was on the ground by those people who are delivering the service. Um, and I think as Lee has demonstrated, the leadership um, of this uh, joint strand of work um, over a number of years, you need leadership, real leadership, um, to break down those barriers. And you need to harvest all of the knowledge and experience of frontline um, delivery people. So um, many, many of the, the areas of work were quite difficult for us to work our way through. And all of the armies between leadership and um, frontline delivery are full of lots and lots of people who give us wonderfully crafted briefings to tell us why we shouldn't do these things. Um, and it was quite a task for many people to work through where the law did not permit us to, um, you know, use each other's powers and, you know, set that aside and work on the things that we really could do. Um, and we built on all of the strong working um, that we had done and we were able to explode lots of the myths um, and had real success um, in working very, very closely together 
to catch criminals um, who might have got away in the past, actually, just simply because of where the walls were built. Um, and it is, you know, this is huge um, if you consider how many local authorities there are in the country. Um, and both Lee at the head of DWP, um, Paul Gray um, at the head of HMRC, me sitting at the top of Jobs Under Plus, we all had a certain power in saying this will happen in my organisation and I have a GB or a UK wide organisation. When you get into 159 local authorities, that's actually quite difficult. Um, but we had huge success sharing intelligence, more joint teams um, working in support of each other. And I think before we talk about some of the outcomes, uh, not to be outdone by Lee, we'll have a little video clip now. <laughs> We're closing in on benefit thieves with hidden cameras. We're closing in with mobile surveillance. We're closing in with over 3,000 fraud investigators. We're closing in on benefit thieves with every means at our disposal. And when we catch you, you could face a criminal record and even a prison sentence. Benefit thieves, we're closing in. So, um, our joint intelligence pilot um, is, you know, something I think that those who led the work can feel incredibly proud of. Um, as part of the programme, um, we set up the joint intelligence desk. DWP's fraud investigation service leads investigations with dedicated um, revenue and customs teams supporting them. And we're also working jointly with employers to analyze tax and national insurance data. We have a number of major causes, um, under, uh, num number of major cases are underway and progressing towards prosecution. And clearly there's difficulty in talking about some of those. And it is too early to report on many of them um, without prejudice and the outcome. But we have had some early successes, and if any of you have ever worked in criminal investigation, you'll know just how long the process can be from, from gathering the first piece of intelligence um, to bringing something to successful uh, prosecution. Um, but, you know, we have managed to do that, and, you know, the next slide deals with one of those where we can identify the individuals uh, here because we, we have prosecuted successfully. But Tundi and uh, Onomi Williams were suspe suspected of using false identities uh, for a significant number of benefit claims. And identity fraud is really big business. And as you close down one avenue um, of fraudulent activity, uh, people simply find another one. Um, criminals don't just decide to behave well. Um, DWP, HMRC and Islington Council worked together on the case. And again, the learning here is to think big, but start small, and then scale fast um, on what works. And our National Intelligence Unit identified that Mrs. Williams was claiming a single parent for multiple children. The intelligence revealed that the identities of those children were the identities of dead children. Um, and that led to discovery and detection of a major fraud. Um, and, and this goes to the heart of the point earlier, that when you find people doing something wrong, there is always a temptation to kind of tick that box and score and say, yeah, we've got it. But a bit more digging, a bit more patience will often turn, you know, turn out a much, much bigger case. Um, and, you know, I'm delighted that, you know, through this joint working that this couple were sentenced at Wood Green Crown Court on the 3rd of August um, to a total of eight years imprisonment. Um, and I have high hopes from what I know of the cases that are already in the pipeline um, of much more to come. And if I go back to those early days of DWP, um, everybody told me how difficult it was. We couldn't even put someone from a local authority in a car with someone from Job Centre Plus in criminal investigation. We couldn't share any sort of intelligence. Um, and actually, they, for all of these conversations, we need to turn them on our head and say, how would we do? Um, 
and you know, not, not, not be put back and keep the customer at the heart, keep the outcome we're seeking at the heart of all we do. The next area I want to move on is tackling the recession. Although I do believe there are those in government at the moment that think we should be tackling the recovery um, and the worst of this is behind us. Who knows, time will tell. Uh, but I left Job Centre Plus um, six, seven months ago and the last year that I was there, that myself and my board and my senior team were preparing the business for a sharp rise in volumes uh, of people becoming unemployed. Um, and looking at how the model we had created from a single channel business of face to face to a multi channel business um, in a much, much smaller and different environment, um, you saw their smaller estate how we would manage that. And of course, we didn't know when it would come. Uh, we were pretty well certain it was coming. We didn't know how sharp it would be, how deep it would be, um, how long it might last. Uh, but we did prepare for it. Um, and we prepared in a joint way um, in talking to all of our other partners uh, for this. We'd always had a rapid response um, force which went into large-scale redundancy uh, and worked with the employer and worked with the, the individuals being made redundant to try and make sure they got reskilled if necessary um, and into employment as quickly as possible and that they knew all of their entitlements. Um, and large-scale could mean you know, 10,000 people uh, in, a, in, in one employer's business, but it could also mean 16 people in a very small uh, rural community. So we, we looked at how we, could, how we could do that and how we could do more, uh, particularly with less. Um, and we looked at HMRC as one of our partners at that point. Um, and of course, HMRC was always in there in that same space. But the role for um, my new department was to get in there and see what we could get for the crown um, as a creditor. Uh, and to see what we could salvage in tax. And that's very different focus from Job Centre Plus and DWP. But of course, another part of our business in HMRC is tax credits um, and benefits uh, for, for many. And through the joint work, and, you know, we now have um, great cooperation, colleagues in the Benefits and Credits Directorate out there in the communities, out there helping in the rapid response and making sure that people know exactly what they're entitled to and that tax credits um, can be paid much quicker and much more accurately. And so far, um, in the HMRC has responded to over 140 requests for that support. Um, now, I think if we hadn't already had the degree of leadership and working in two very, very large organisations, I mean, we're not far off a couple of hundred thousand in our two departments, and then playing in um, all that we've learned from in and out of work with local authorities, we could not have moved so swiftly. Um, and we, I don't think we could have had the cooperation um, and response. Um, am I going to hand back to you now, Lee? Off you, you go then. Thank you. I think you are. <laughs> um, we thought we'd just talk um, at uh, slightly uh, less length about just a range of some of the other initiatives we've pursued and are pursuing. So this will be a kind of a, a slightly more uh, rapid fire, just to give a sort of an illustration. Um, debt, debt, there's a thing. People owe us money. Uh, people owe the revenue money and people owe the DWP money for all sorts of reasons. And surprise, surprise, actually, uh, many people owe us both money. And you might say, if you were a man coming down from Mars, or a woman coming down from Mars, wouldn't it be a good idea if we could try and recover that money in one operation, rather than in two separate ones? Uh, that seemed a bit of a revelation, so we thought we'd give it a go. And uh, the first thing is we um, established a joint team to see if we could find out whether there was any factual basis for this. And the team did indeed identify that, as it says on the um, overhead, 16% of people who owe money to HMRC also owe money to DWP, and 11% the other way around. And we've worked and worked and worked away at that. It's been a long, at times, a bit of a grinding process, I have to say. 
But we've now been able to put a package of recommendations to our two uh, sets of ministers, which we hope could lead to savings, better recoveries for the taxpayer of approaching £40 million a year. Uh, that's um, better joint handling of both individuals and groups um, and um, being able to pursue debts on behalf of each other. One uh, bit, the last bit on that slide is, is sort of breathtakingly simple when you stand back from it, which is one of the inhibitors in recovering debt is we often can't find out where people are. We've simply lost track of them. We don't have an address for them. Um, it occurred uh, to us in a, a kind of a moment of madness that maybe even if DWP didn't have an address for them, maybe HMRC did, or the other way round. And we found out that that is indeed the case. So now we use both departments' databases to see if we can find an address for someone who owes us money. Now, you might again think that that is sort of breathtakingly simple. But it's fair to say that um, uh, for the first two or three times that that um, issue was on our table at the Joint Steering Group, people brought us perfectly properly, it's part of our job as civil servants, all the difficulties in doing that. Data sharing, lack of legal powers, um, training, a whole host of reasons. And we, in a way, had to keep saying, thank you, that's really helpful to tell us why we can't do this, but it would be really good if you could tell us now why we can and how we might. And if that's one lesson that shines through to this, as civil servants, it's a very good thing to tell senior colleagues and ministers the realities, the obstacles, the difficulties, etc. It's an even better thing if you turn the page and say, but here are some ways we might be able to overcome that rather than stop at the first page. So that's been and goes on being a big success. National insurance recording system for colleagues in DWP or HMRC in the audience, the words NERS are enough to strike dread into the heart of any one man, woman or child. Um, this is a system which Leslie owns. Um, I'm not um, uh, keen to buy it off her, incidentally. <laughs> um, but on which we absolutely and completely depend. And this is a very recent example of our cooperation because Leslie had to, in effect, switch this system off for five days recently in order that a major upgrade of the system could take place. And that was not exactly received um, with joyful adulation by colleagues in DWP, because we depend on that system every single day to um, uh, identify and um, uh, decide on claims for a whole range of benefits. So this was not uh, wonderful. In the good old days, or the bad old days, I think what would have happened is we would have had teams um, exchanging endless, long, difficult notes um, in slightly combative terms to one another, um, explaining why what the other one wanted or was doing was either difficult or creating uh, real problems, etc. Uh, so we decided to do it a different way. And that's, we just looked at this as if this was one project we had to do it. It was absolutely clear this upgrade had to go ahead. It was absolutely clear we needed to maintain as good a service as we could. During the five days, the system would not be there. We needed to have contingency plans in case it didn't come back up at the end of those five days. And so we simply worked together in an incredibly intensive way. How could we between us reduce the risks? How could we have one set of messages going out to customers and stakeholders? How could we best share information? How could we have joint contingency plans? I'm pleased to say it is a huge tribute to Leslie, um, who used to have even more hair than she presents now, <laughs> that this upgrade went absolutely to plan, came back up after five days, but the fact is that we got through those five days in our two departments and uh, presented and were able to continue a vastly better service to our customers because we effectively worked together, worked together to deliver this as one uh, project. Huge compliment to the HMRC colleagues who actually undertook a massive technical upgrade of the system during those five days. Pension reform. I could give you a uh, little lecture, um, UK Pensions Policy, 1803 to 2009, but I think I might um, uh, kind of trespass on the goodwill of my audience. Let us simply say that we are undertaking, uh, led by my department, a huge programme of uh, pensions reform 
uh, which was uh, set in place by the Turner Commission report of a couple of years ago and involves huge, huge changes to the state pension system, um, a reduction in the number of qualifying years that people have to have, which will come in in 2010, 2010 to um, qualify for a uh, complete pension, uh, the gradual extension of the state pension age from 60 and 65, as it is at the moment for women and men respectively, to what will be 68 uh, for any of us who are still uh, around as we approach 2050. This is one which is a really good example of joint working because there's an awful lot in this for DWP. DWP has actually to deliver this enormous program of change. If Leslie simply sat down and looked at her own objectives, this doesn't figure. She's got no objective to deliver a huge government program of pension reform. And actually, all that this presents for Leslie is difficulty. She has to do lots of things in order to help us, which she wouldn't ideally uh, want to do because they don't directly help her achieve her objectives. Again, in the good old days, um, we might well have spent a vast amount of time simply debating at how much, as an absolute minimum, HMRC had to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, uh, in the spirit of what is now a well-established cooperation, we looked at this as one joint project. There is a government priority to reform the pension system. How best could we work together in order to deliver it? This is work in progress. But there we are, a couple of quotes from ministers. Rosie Winterton, um, until recently pensions minister, I'm pleased to report that as a result of this close working between our two departments, we are near to achieving the desired changes. An OGC, OGC gateway review, not given to any um, great statements. They normally tell you what you haven't done properly, not what you're doing well. An exemplar model for cross-departmental programme working. Other initiatives, just quickly. Um, customer charters. Um, we both believe with a passion that we're there to serve customers. Uh, both of us have millions of customers on any working day. Both of us have wanted to produce charters, setting out in very simple terms what we offer and what we expect of our customers. Uh, again, in the past, we'd have done that in complete isolation from one another. Actually, now, we've done it very closely together. And whilst those two charters are different and will be different because uh, we have different uh, businesses, we have different customers to some extent, nevertheless, they have been put together, written together, and they uh, form a complementary whole rather than two entirely separate documents. And last, but in no sense least, let's see if we can move on, uh, people. Uh, people. Um, again, there was always some cooperation between our two departments uh, in relation to people, you know, kind of people being slightly inconvenient, occasionally wanted to transfer between our two departments or kind of applied for jobs in each other's department and got them and, you know, uh, we kind of would make the systems work. But we didn't have a lot of real standing back and saying, how can we benefit uh, one another by working together on the HR sphere? Uh, first of all, we actually now have an agreement between our two departments. Our teams, particularly in the areas of redeployment and recruitment, work really closely together. We're often, it's almost in the nature of our business cycles, uh, in a situation where one of us is recruiting whilst another of us is shedding. And it makes obvious uh, sense to put those two together and maximise the opportunities for redeployment. HMRC, another good example, rather than doing everything in isolation, has actually appointed DWP to provide its apprenticeships uh, training programme, and we also provide HMRC's um, NVQ uh, system. And uh, we've worked together on the uh, recent skills survey. Most importantly, actually, and not on this slide, um, is um, uh, DWP, Job Centre Plus, is um, as a counter-cyclical organisation, one of the few organisations in Britain which is recruiting as if there is no tomorrow at this moment in order that there are enough people in Job Centre Plus to handle the rapidly rising numbers of unemployed people who are our customers. We are um, uh, recruiting at uh, the rate of uh, uh, around 500 people a week, and that is a huge ask of any organisation. HMRC, knowing that that was incredibly tough, have lent us people, lent us support, lent us capability to boost that recruitment effort. So that has been a, a huge asset. 
and that whole kind of joint working just would not have existed uh, uh, even a few years ago. So that's it, folks, except for a conclusion, which my co-star will deliver. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, you know, I, I, I feel hugely um, proud of what's been achieved um, in, in both departments and, as I said, with, with local authorities and, and often other delivery partners. Um, but, I, but I think I, I feel um, uniquely pleased, having spent so much of my life in the welfare to work in skills industry and now um, working in revenue and customs, to to understand both sides of this coin and to often see what the barriers are um, and what the requirements are of each other. And that very much uh, saw us through the major upgrade in the PSUN and national insurance system. No longer NERS folks, it's NIPS now. Um, so uh, it is successfully launched. Um, and, and I think it was, it was terrific during that time and all the difficulties it caused for Job Centre Plus and the pension service in terms of dealing with claims that not only did Lee and I work through the issue together of being without nurse and successfully restoring that service, um, but we had at each level below is already the machinery of people working together to, to make it the best possible experience for customers and stakeholders. Um, and I had Lee's absolute support, including you know, an invitation to call on his resources in DWP, particularly in the corporate IT world, should we need additional support. Um, and I think there are lessons in how we can all do a lot more with a lot less if we work in that way. So we will continue to take forward projects that we're already collaborating on and identify new areas where we can improve both our service uh, to customers and value for money. Um, we can continue, you know, we have a long, long journey on transformation of public services. Um, we, we all know that that's why we exist. Um, and if we can all keep that spirit of the customer being at the heart of everything we do, if we can all think about maybe how much less tax we might be paying, um, if we're getting best value for taxpayers' money, if we can think of all of that work we can do on those who bend or break the rules, um, just how much more money there would be to put into those vital public services, then, then the spirit of how could we, how would we, um, will live on. So thank you very much. Thank you.